Here we're going to take a look at qualitative behavior of solutions to differential equations and the relationships to what makes the original differential equation, for example, equal to zero in this case. Um, we're going to look at this specific differential equation, dy dt is minus one half times y minus four. And we're going to look for patterns and behaviors uh, that we have between the graph of this function. Think of this as a function where this is like my f of x and this is my x. Okay, output input. And we're going to plot it on an axis that looks like this. Where this is dy dt. And this is y. So keep in mind this is not the independent variable t. This is the dependent variable of this particular differential equation. <coughs> Okay, and then what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at its relationship to the graph where on this axis we're going to put the output of the function. So this is just the graph of the function that is the solution to this. And here we're going to have the, dependent the independent variable t. So we're going to see if we can actually find a relationship between these two graphs and how it's related to the slope field that we would see in this particular graph. Notice that here, the horizontal axis is the y-axis. Here, the vertical axis is the y-axis. So this axis and this axis are the same things. Okay, We're just representing them a little bit differently. So in order to graph it, though, uh, we're going to need a function plotter. So we're going to treat this as if it's kind of like my little f of x. And this is like my little x. Okay, so in order to graph it, my machine requires me to call it x and f of x. So we're going to do it that way. So let's take a look. Let me add a graphs page. And let's graph minus one half times the quantity x minus four. We all know what this is going to be. It's going to be a straight line. Okay, and there it is. Let's move this guy out of the way here. All right, so we're getting something that looks kind of like this. Here's four. Okay, that's the uh, horizontal intersection there. And so the graph is kind of coming in like that. Okay, so let's think about what this really would mean from the standpoint of the original graph, y of t. <coughs> so notice that this axis is dy dt. So the outputs of this graph, okay, the vertical axis, represent the actual slopes of the original function, okay, dy dt. So what this is saying is when my y coordinate is lower than 4, I have positive outputs for dy dt because it's above the axis. Therefore, it's going to have positive slopes. So if I were to mark 4 over here on the same y-axis, except written vertically, what this is saying is when I'm, quote, below 4 in value, aka this zone here, I should have positive slopes. When I'm above 4 in value for the y-coordinate, notice this is below the axis. This axis represents the slope of the original function, so I should have negative slopes. So when I'm in this zone up here, I should end up having negative slopes. Okay. Now, the further away I am from 4, the bigger the negative slope. The closer I am to 4, the less the negative slope. So it's still going to be going down. So as I creep up on 4 here, it should start to level off because at 4, the slope, which is this axis, is 0. Okay, It's an intercept. So at this location over here, I should have horizontal slopes. My slope is 0. So my field lines will look something like this. Because at a y-coordinate of 4, I have a slope of 0 on this x. So let's take a look at that. Let's actually plot it. <coughs> Excuse me. Add another graph. 
This time I'm going to switch it to a differential equation plotter. Okay, and I got to remember, I got to call my, my uh, dependent variable y1 instead of y in this machine. So I'm going to say minus one half times the quantity y1 minus four. And I get something that looks like this. Let me pull this down just a little bit so we can see it better. And I'll put it right about there. Let me go down a little further so we can see it a little bit better. Sorry, I'm just fudging the location so we can see it when we graph it a little bit better. All right, so there we go. And what you're seeing is, like we said before, when my y coordinate is lower than four, I should have positive slopes. So when my y coordinate is lower than four, look down here. I've got positive field lines. So they've got steepnesses that are positive. When I am above four in value for the y coordinate up here, I should have negative slope values because I'm below the axis on this graph. And so therefore I should see negative field lines, which is exactly what I have here. So depending on what my initial condition is, I'm actually going to see different behavior. So let's say I have an initial condition that puts a point on the graph up here. Okay, you'll see that the graph is going to follow the field lines like this. If I have an initial condition, let's say down here, then it's going to follow those field lines like that. something to that effect. We can actually see it by plotting the field lines. Let's take a look. All right, let's give it some initial condition. So I'm going to do a double click here. Go in and let's say, I think the book wants you to do zero, two maybe. Okay, so that puts the initial condition down here, zero, two. And you'll see that it follows those field lines. Now, if I grab this initial condition, I can move him. If I pull him up and give a different initial condition, I get a different behavior of the solution to this differential equation. So the initial condition will determine what the function is. But you'll notice if I start off with a high y coordinate, I'm going to start off in this zone with a quote negative slope. Okay, remember this is the slope axis. So the values, the outputs over here represent the slopes on this graph. So if I start with uh, something above four, I'm going to have negative field lines, negative slope field lines. If I start below four, I'm going to have positive slope field lines. All right, we often refer to this um, value right here as what's called an equilibrium solution. Okay, so it's an equilibrium solution to the differential equation. Here we're actually depicting it on the vertical axis. Here we're depicting it on the horizontal axis. Both of these axes are y. Okay, those are the outputs of the original function. Okay, we're just relating them in a different way. All right. Now, we can play around with this and see what's going to happen uh, depending on the initial condition. So, for example, suppose, and I think the book wants you to look at this, suppose I have y of 0 equals 6. Okay. We would like to know, for example, what is the uh, algebraic expression for the solution to this differential equation. Okay. Well, we can do that. Let's pop back over here. Whoops, don't want to do that. We go that. Okay. 
So y prime equals negative one half. Oops. Let me use my symbol manipulator there, or my symbol palette. One half times y minus four. My independent variable is, um, in case I want to plot it, I'm going to call it x instead of t. My dependent variable I'm going to call y. And I get something that looks like this. So you get C1 I just call it A E to the minus T over 2 I'm sticking with the variable T here plus 4 A is going to be determined by the initial condition Okay. So if y of 0 is 6, that's going to imply that 6 is equal to a e to the 0. If I plug a 0 in for t here, I get e to the 0, which is 1, plus 4. So that's going to say a is 2. So my function becomes... y of t is equal to 2, e to the minus t over 2 plus 4. All right? And we can check that to see if it really is a solution to the differential equation. Let me grab this. Let's define this guy. <coughs> I'm just going to in there as um, I'm going to put it in F2 simply because I'm probably going to want to plot it later all right and let's check this differential equation to see if it actually matches right take its derivative Actually, if I want, I can call it t. doesn't matter what I call it. So the derivative gives me that. Now let's compute this side. Minus 1 half times the quantity f2 of t. minus 4. Lo and behold, I get the same thing. So it is a solution to the differential equation that we started with. If we want to plot it and see what that's going to look like, the reason I used x when I defined it is because uh, I was going to plot it on this window over here. So let me change this now to a function plotter. Here's f2. Let me tell it to show up. And there it is. And watch what happens when I change the initial condition in my diff EQ mode here. Let's make this 0, 6. Boom. And so you see the Euler's method approximation is falling right on top of the graph that we just had. Okay, there they are. Okay. So now we can actually also explore what's going to happen with the behavior of this guy. Um, suppose I play around with uh, changing this value here. Okay. Let's actually look at these two guys side by side and see what's going to happen. All right. So let me go in here real quick. And let me, well, first let me delete... Oops, 
delete the function here. I'm going to turn off F2. Actually, I'm just going to delete it. Okay, so now all I have is this. I can then go in and um, even get rid of the initial condition if I want. Okay, so I just got rid of the initial condition so we can look at these guys side by side. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm actually going to put this graph and this graph, oops, and this graph side by side so we can kind of see the behavior. And I'm gonna actually put a slider in and change this four to just a slider that we can control, okay? We can play around with it and we'll look at see how the slope field reacts. Now to do that, I'm going to insert a new page, not a new problem, because I want all the information that's stored in this problem to stay with me. And I'm going to hit um, escape right now because I want to actually split the screen because I want to have on the left this graph and on the right this graph. So to do that, I'm going to go to dock page layout and I'm going to say select layout. And here you can see icons for the, this is the side to side split layout number two. That's what I'm going to choose. Okay, now you can see over here, uh, this side actually has a slightly bordered pane. The pane's got a little bit darker border around it than the one over on the other side. So that's the active window. So what I'm going to do is I want to copy the graph that I had over here into this space. So I'm just going to page over till I get to that. To select the application, this is a really cool feature, is I can do what's called Control K, and you'll see the border of it start to flash, okay? What that's doing is it's selecting the application, and then I'm gonna copy it, because I don't wanna copy a static image, I wanna copy all the information that goes along with it. So once I've got it flashing with Control K, I'm gonna do Control C to copy, just like we've done in the past. Now I'm gonna page back over here, while this is my active window, I'm then going to do Control V to paste it. And you'll see there it is. Now I'm going to go over here, I'm going to click on this pane to make it active. And I'm going to do the same thing with the slope field page. So Control K to copy it. I'm sorry, to select it. Control C to copy it. I'm going to go back over here with this pane active and do Control V to paste it. Okay, so now you can kind of see what's happening in the connection to these two guys. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a slider in here. So I'm going to activate that pane. I'm going to say menu, action, insert slider. And I'm just going to call it C. Okay, and I can choose uh, whatever range I want it to be in. I'll just say negative five to five, sounds good. Uh, and then I'm gonna go down to, um, I'm gonna make the current value the current value, which is four. Okay. And then I'm gonna change my step size to like 0 0.001. So I've got a little bit of play in it. If I wanna see more digits, I can do this. I can change however many I want. Right now it's float three, but you can change it to whatever you like. I'll just leave it as the default. Click OK. And there it is. I'm going to make it a little bit longer so I can play with it a little bit. Okay. There we go. So now I can grab this guy and pull it back and forth. So now in order to be able to tie it to this, I'm going to click on this guy and I'm going to change that four to C. Okay, it shouldn't change the graph right now because I set it to, I set C to four initially. So you won't see a change in the graph. Okay, but now when I pull that, it's going to work. I'm going to do the same thing over here, except I don't have to put a slider on this window because I've already got it over here and it's going to share the information between the two. So what I'm going to do over here is I'm going to click on this 
I'm going to go into my uh, back to differential equation plotter. And now when I go up here to my differential equation, I'm going to change that 4 to a C also. So now both of these slope fields are going to be tied to the same slider, so to speak. Okay, and you'll notice nothing really changed because my slider was at 4. But watch what's going to happen when I pull on this guy. By pulling on this guy, remember what I'm doing is I'm changing this value right here. So because this is minus 1 half y minus that value, if these two values match, I'm going to get 0. So that's still going to correspond to my equilibrium solution. So watch what happens when I drag it. Watch my slope field change. Right now, if I change this guy to say 2, close to it, here we go. Actually, let me just, I can click on the slider itself and type in 2. So if I make it 2, what you'll notice over here is that where this guy crosses the axis, I still end up with that same value as where the horizontal uh, field line goes. So I can pull this and change it any way I want and notice the similar behavior. I'm still going to have on this side of wherever this root is, on this side it's always going to be below the axis, so therefore I'm going to have negative field lines. On this side uh, of the axis here, so if I'm, quote, below whatever that is, I'm going to have positive field lines. And so as a result, I'm going to keep the same shape happening. I'm just changing where this horizontal field line is. So what we notice is if I have above axis to below axis happening, I'm basically going to have something that sucks the graph toward that field line. Now I can also explore what happens if I've got a variety of different roots, and we're going to talk about that in just a second. Okay, now what we're going to do is we're going to um, actually look at a slightly different differential equation where I've added an additional root. So you can see here, uh, we took the one we were playing with before and I just added a, another root. So now the roots of this are y equals 0 and y equals 4. Okay, so we can play with these guys a little bit. And we can kind of see what kind of behavior I'm going to get out of it in uh, comparison to the first example. So let's start again by looking at the plot of the derivative dy dt versus the dependent variable y. And then we're going to also look at the plot of y versus t, the independent variable. Okay, so let's take a look. Again, we're going to plot it. We're going to pretend this is like my f of x, and these guys are my x's instead of y's because my machine is going to force me to do that. So I'm going to put in minus 1 half time, whoops, times x times the quantity x minus 4. So my graph ends up looking something like this. Pull him out of the way. So you can see the roots are at 0 and at 4. And the graph looks something like that. Okay. Now let's think before we actually even plot the slope field, let's think about what this would mean. Remember, this axis here, vertical on this graph, represents the slopes of the solution to the differential equation. All right, so here, when I'm in, when I'm below zero for my uh, dependent variable, remember, this axis and this axis are the same. Okay, when I'm below, when I'm below zero here, I have negative slopes. So what that's saying is, if I look at this as my y-axis, so to speak, that's vertical, and this is my y-axis is horizontal, when I'm down here, I should have negative slopes. When I'm between 0 and 4, this is above the axis here, meaning the outputs are slopes. So I'm above the axis, so I have positive slopes. 
So if I look at four here, let's say, okay, between zero and four, I should have field lines that are going upwards. Okay. When I am beyond four, in that case in this zone, I have negative slopes because this is again below the axis. So therefore I should see slope field lines that are going down. Again, at four and at zero, I actually end up with uh, horizontal field lines because the slopes, dy dt, are zero here and here. Okay, the outputs on this graph are zero here and here. Okay, so let's take a look at this real quick. Let me, to make the field lines a little more visible, let me get a different color here. Pull a different color out of my pocket. So here at zero, I should have a slope of zero. So I should have a field line like this. Okay. And at four, I should have a slope of zero. So I have field lines. They go like that. All right. So we've kind of conceptually taken this graph and deconstructed it into what the field line should look like over here. So let's take a look at it and let's actually graph it. So let me put in a new page, graphs page. Let's change it to differential equation plots. Okay. This is now my differential equation. So I'm going to have minus one half. times y1. Okay, I gotta keep remembering to do that because I have a habit of forgetting that. I call it y all the time. y1 minus four inside the parentheses. I'm not gonna give it any initial condition right now so we can see what it looks like. And right now the field lines are so uh, sparse that it's really kind of hard to see the pattern. So I'm gonna go in and up the number of field lines. So if I tab over to my dot 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 there I can go down and change my field resolution let's go to 20 and see how that looks this will just put more little field lines in there okay that's a little bit better let me drag them down just a little bit so we can see them see if I can get those horizontal field lines to kind of show up nicely a little close Oh, there we go. Pretty close. There we go. That looks pretty good. I just adjusted it so that the, where the tick marks are falling and the field lines are right on top. So you can see the you've got the horizontal field line right here, and you have a horizontal field line right here on the axis, okay, which is kind of what we predicted. Again, when I am, quote, above four, meaning above four to the right here, I end up with a negative slope because this is below the axis and this is the slope. And so therefore you see negative field lines, negative slope field lines are going like this. When I'm in between zero and four, this thing is above the axis, AKA the slope is positive. Therefore I see positive slope field lines in between those two. And when I'm down here below zero for a Y coordinate, AKA down here, I end up again below the axis. So I have negative field lines again. And you can see I've got negative field lines over here down below. Now let's give it an initial condition and drag the guy around so we can kind of see the behavior uh, of these equilibrium solutions and see how the original conditions are actually going to affect what the graph does. So here we go. Let me double click. Let me give this guy some initial conditions. See if your text has you do specific ones. Uh, it looks like they use y of zero equaling negative one, zero, and so on. So it looks like uh, basically they're doing a y coordinate or an X, a t coordinate, x coordinate in this case, of zero. And then they use like negative one, zero, one, and so on. So let's just throw one in here. Let's do um, negative one. All right. 
So what you see here, and it's kind of a little bit hard to see, but it's coming from the left. And because these slope field lines are negative, it's doing this. It's starting to go downward. Now, if I drag this guy into another zone, let's drag him like anywhere in this zone, for example, you'll see the same sort of behavior because I'm coming from the left. So as I come from the left, these are negative field lines, so it's going to collapse downward. So it's, in a sense, being repelled away from this equilibrium solution. If I move into this zone, in here, you'll notice that as I come from the left, I'm going to have positive slope, so I'm going to go up, but I've got a maximum positiveness, like right here, about two. And you'll notice that there's an inflection point there. That's where this thing turns over, right? It basically rolls over at two and then starts to level back off because my slope then starts to become less and less positive and approaches a slope of zero. Uh, this is actually a really powerful curve. We're going to talk about this later when we talk about modeling. And right now, with things like the coronavirus going on, this is what's referred to as a logistic model. The idea that it increases somewhat exponentially initially, but then rolls over and levels off. Uh, you know, when you think about virus transmission, for example, eventually, you know, there's going to be a limited number of people who get it and it's going to level off to that. The worst case scenario is if eventually the whole population gets infected. Uh, so you can't ever go above that cap. And so a logistic model is what's called a limited growth model. We use it for things like deer population, a variety of things. Uh, and we'll talk about that later when we start looking at applications of differential equations. Okay, But that's kind of in this zone right here. Now, if I go above, if I go up in here, again, as I'm coming from the left, it's got negative field lines. So it's going to go down and approach that asymptote, Okay, this equilibrium solution. So what's happening is that no matter where I am, if I'm down in here or if I'm up here, I'm in a sense, my graph is being sucked toward this equilibrium solution. Okay. If I am down here in this zone and I look at this equilibrium solution, if you look horizontally, it's being repelled away from it as I move from left to right and approaching this one. If I'm down here, I'm also being repelled away from it. So we actually have terms for these. Um, we call the ones that we are sucked toward uh, stable and the ones we are kind of pushed away from, we're calling unstable, okay, equilibrium solutions. So what I'm seeing here, let me get a different color. Pick, uh, don't want blue. Let's try yellow. So if I'm up here, my field lines are saying that my graph is doing something like this. If I'm in this zone, it's doing something like this. And if I'm in this zone, it's doing something like this. So here, if I'm being attracted, oops, not K, attract. If I'm being attracted, we call that stable. Okay, if I'm being repelled, we call it unstable. Okay. Now, when we think about it, we can actually look, be able to look at this graph and immediately tell whether it's stable or unstable. So take just a second, think about it for a minute, look at the behavior of this graph and try to find a pattern between this thing's behavior and whether or not it's a stable or unstable equilibrium position. So take just a second and reflect.
All right, so we're back. What'd you notice? Think about what it would be if it was being attracted. What that would mean is if I have a larger Y value, okay, I would want to have negative field lines, negative slope field lines. If I have a lower um, Y coordinate, I want to have positive field lines because that's going to move it in this direction. So negative slope field, positive slope field, negative to positive. So what that's saying is, if I am further to the right, I want to have a negative value. If I'm further to the left, I want to have a positive value. So in a sense, I am looking at a zone like this, where I'm going from above the axis to below the axis. Okay, because in this zone here, I've got positive field lines. So if I'm, quote, beneath this coordinate on this graph, it's going to have positive field lines moving in this direction. If I am above four, so to speak, higher than four, larger than four, I'm going to have negative slopes. So I'm going to have negative field lines. So when I have a graph that is going from when I have a dy dt versus y graph that goes from above to below, going left to right, okay, I'm going to end up with a stable equilibrium position. Contrary over here, if I want to have something that's being repelled, okay, what I really want to have happen is when I'm beneath it or lower than that value, than that equilibrium solution value, I want to have I want to have negative field lines. So here I've got negative slopes. And then when I move to the opposite side of it, I want to have positive slopes because that's going to push me away from it. It's going to push me up. So that corresponds to this scenario. The color is not working very well. Let me pick a different color. Okay, so what that's saying is, if I want to have something repelled, make it unstable, I want to be, as I go from left to right on the dy dt versus y graph, I want to go from beneath to above. So I want to actually have kind of an increasing uh, across the root, and I want to have decreasing across the root if I want to have a stable condition. Okay, and if you think about the way the field lines manipulate, that's kind of what you get. So what this is really saying is I can take a look at the dy dt versus y graph and infer whether something is stable or unstable and whether it's going to attract or repel the original function to those field lines. So this is basically a look at the qualitative behavior of solutions to differential equations and what we can do to actually infer that information simply from a plot of the differential equation itself, not the slope field, but just the graph of dy dt versus y. Okay, this is allowing us to make these inferences without actually having to see the field lines. Now, the nice thing is we can actually plot the field lines and get a feel for what's happening by pulling up and down on that initial condition. Uh, but anyway, this is crucial when we try to construct a differential equation that models the kind of behavior we see in nature, right? So, for example, as I talked about earlier, the idea of the logistic curve, where I start with a, an initial value and it kind of grows pseudo exponentially, but then eventually levels off to a cap, uh, is a common behavior we see in nature uh, when it comes to things like virus transmission, which is what we're dealing with right now, uh, or things like uh, monitoring deer population. Uh, for example, in uh, Mount Pleasant, we've got Vites Woods, which is uh, a wooded area where we um, can go over and biology classes can do things in that in that area. Well, unfortunately, for those of us who live near Vites Woods, or fortunately, uh, the deer can wreak havoc on your garden, <laughs> on your shrubs, a variety of different things. So every so often, the city actually sends in sharpshooters to thin the herd of deer that we have there, because otherwise, I mean, I, I literally have deer on my patio. 
uh, on a regular basis. So uh, when you can model the situation that deer don't really grow exponentially because vice woods is limited in terms of space and so there's a limited amount of food. So there's only so much uh, deer, so many deer that the forest can supply food for. And so eventually they'll reach what's called a carrying capacity. That's the stable uh, condition here where eventually, you know, the, the super healthy deer survive, the other ones die off of starvation or whatever uh, because of competition. So you don't want that to happen. So when we use this kind of model, we can make predictions as to what the deer population will be at what time. And then we can decide how often to send the sharpshooters in to thin the herd. So we can plan accordingly uh, from a financial standpoint to say, okay, if we're going to have to pay people to go in and do this, uh, you know, how many years out do we have to do it? Every three years, every five years, whatever. And so by monitoring the deer population like this, we can actually make those predictions and budget for it. So the mathematics is used around us all the time. Uh, sometimes it's going on in the background. Uh, so it's important to know that these concepts and what we're talking about with differential equations have far-reaching applications in society, and in this case, particularly nature. So anyway, I hope this was helpful, and the, take a look at uh, section 7.2, work on the homework. We're going to do some more applications of this thing later in chapter 7.